Welcome to Amplify Third Party Risk Management presented by Security Scorecard and OnSpring. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Uh, I think we've got a really neat story to tell and, and certainly appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us. Um, so just by way of introduction, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason Rolfe. I'm the Vice President of Solutions here with OnSpring. Um, my team is primarily responsible for, you know, I guess the simplest way to put it is, is for helping our, our clients and our customers really do their best work and making the best use out of the OnSpring platform to solve whatever business problems they have. So I'm really excited to be here with you today and show you kind of the OnSpring side of this, of this partnership, of this integration. Um, I'm also delighted to have with me my, uh, my, my new friend, Alex Rich from Security Scorecard. So Alex, if you wouldn't mind giving yourself a, a quick intro. Appreciate the tea up here, Jason. Um, everyone, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us here today. Really excited about both the content for this webinar and the, the overarching partnership that we've formed here with OnSpring. So to Jason's point, I'm Alex Rich. I'm a senior director on the Alliances team here at Security Scorecard. Uh, a bit about me, I've been with the organization for going on four years now, which in, in startup speak makes me a bit of a lifer. I uh, cut my teeth here on our CS team, so working with Folks that I'd imagine are pretty similar to people on the line who are potentially using our integrated solutions to tackle the vendor risk management problem, right? So I spent some time doing that, about a year and a half. I led one of our selling teams for about another year and a half. And then back in April, I pivoted over to the alliances team where one of my primary focuses is on integrations and integration partners like OnSpring. I'd, I'd like to think that I can use a lot of what I was able to discern and pick up during the CS days to help kind of build something together with OnSpring that'll support all of you across you know, your needs, which can include, but can go wider than vendor risk management. So again, Jason, appreciate the intro. Very happy to be here. Absolutely. And Alex, I guess if four years at a startup makes you an old timer, I guess at nine years at OnSpring, I'm kind of like Methuselah. So I've been around for, for quite some time, but uh, no, really happy to be a part of this. Um, you know, Alex and I have been, have been having a lot of great conversations, us and the security scorecard team. And, and we really feel like, I mean, we've, we've already got a really great use case to share with you guys. And we also both feel like, hey, we're just scratching the surface on where this thing can go. So really excited to, to kind of take you through this today. Okay, so just a quick agenda, nothing fancy, just relatively simple. We, we know that there's going to be folks on the line. Some of us, uh, some of you folks on the line know OnSpring, some of you folks on the line work with Security Scorecard. We're really glad to have you all together. Um, but obviously, for the benefit of either side, we want to make sure we give you guys a good overview of what Security Scorecard is, what they provide, what, what services they provide, what their, what their platform allows you to do in terms of evaluating cyber risk within your third-party community. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about who OnSpring is. What's the, the platform and the service that we offer? How do our clients make use of that? And then we'll really spend, you know, a, a good portion of the time, you know, uh, on focusing on, on why you guys came here in the first place, which, which is to see, you know, what happens when you mix security scorecard and OnSpring together? How can we make use of great data on one side to empower, to automate, to inform, uh, and to drive action on the other side? Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, turn it over to Alex to give us a little bit of a background on security scorecard. So Alex, uh, take it away. Thank you, Jason. So I personally am a big fan of storytelling. So I'm going to tell you kind of a story of, as to how we kind of came to be and how our, our story started here. So with respect to Security Scorecard, it starts with two gentlemen, um, Alex and Sam. Those are our co-founders. Both are former CISOs, and at the time of the story, we're both working at Guilt Group. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Guilt, Guilt is an e-commerce platform that specializes in high-end fashion at highly discounted rates. And one of the things that really stood out about Guilt at the time was they were really forward-thinking with respect to technology and the use of third-party vendors and services, right? So as a byproduct of that focus, there were kind of two things that were really keeping Alex and Sam up at night during that period. So first and foremost, Simply put, they were overwhelmed by the volume of assessment requests that they were getting all again associated with these third party suppliers and vendors they wanted to take advantage of. So big number and a very agile, constantly rotating number translated into a lot of assessments. And in addition, they did not trust the accuracy and or completeness of the information that they were getting from their vendors. Um, they had a pretty close call with one vendor that involved exposed unencrypted credit card data 
And I would like to think that was kind of the watershed moment that led to the question that I have up on screen, which I'm assuming they asked to one to the to each other. That's what I've been told. So the question was, can we instantly and non intrusively measure the security of any company in the world and show it how to improve? Next slide. And thank you. And the answer is yes. Um, and that led to the birth of security scorecard. So what are we, what do we do and why do we matter? So Security Scorecard is the leading provider of cyber risk ratings. And the best way to think about cyber risk ratings is to think credit rating, but instead of measuring the financial health and stability of an organization, we instead measure the cybersecurity posture and resilience of an organization. Now, I appreciate that's a bit of a bold parallel, right? Given how pervasive the credit rating is, how important it is to the modern day business. But I'm comfortable drawing it for two primary reasons. So first and foremost, both financial risk and cyber risk are two types of risks that all businesses face. Um, now, this wasn't the case, call it 10 to 20 years ago, when there were certain businesses that were heavy users and adopters of technology and others that weren't, right? I mean, if you're not using technology at scale, you do not have cyber exposure. But at this point in time, at this stage in the world, right, all businesses are heavily reliant on technology. And with that comes universal exposure to cyber risk. Um, parallel number two, um, both cyber risk and financial risks are what I like to refer to as infrastructure risks, in that they're the type of risks that if left unchecked, they have the potential to bring a business down. It really doesn't matter how well everything else is going. You might have that perfect company that has incredibly loyal customers, fat profit margins, all the positive things that you would look for in an organization. But if that company can't service a credit facility or make payroll and they go bankrupt, what matters, right? It's, it all kind of gets flushed and in a similar vein. You may have that similar perfect company and they go out and suffer a crippling data breach, right? Now they're getting fined by the regulators because they actually violated a few controls in the process and their consumers are suing them because now their identities have been stolen and putting those two things aside, the reputation is tarnished, right? No one's gonna go out after, no one's gonna touch them with the 10 foot pole after this. So in the same vein, that cyber attack brought them down, right? So that's kind of, the two reasons why I'm comfortable with the parallel. And look, I think it's a really great way to both describe what we do, but it also kind of highlights what we can do from a use case potential and that you can pretty much take any use case right now that involves a credit rating, swap a cyber rating in and it makes sense. And I've actually had the privilege of seeing that involve kind of in front of my face over the past four years. You know, when I got here and we started, we were really just focused on two use cases, which were monitor yourself and monitor your vendors. But over the course of the past few years, we're beginning to follow in the footsteps of that credit rating. Now we're working with cyber insurance underwriters who are trying to underwrite policy for companies and they're using our scores to influence the underwriting process or to directly price policy. Um, now we're seeing a big use case within kind of the M&A and due diligence space where companies want to leverage a tool like this to evaluate a potential acquisition target and the suppliers that they use. And I'm sure there are a number of other use cases that are taking place right now that aren't visible to me, but I imagine that the common thread is that they all involve understanding the cyber related risks of another of a company. It could be your own, could be a third party. And in a lot of respects, you will see some version of the use case being supported by the credit rating. So putting that aside, we are the industry leader in this space at this time, get into why in a few slides. And we are currently serving, I believe it's about 1400 customers across 42 countries. And within those customers, one of the things that excites me is we typically serve customers across multiple use cases, not just one. Next slide. So how does the platform work? At a high level, we're really doing two things here. We are identifying the publicly facing digital assets that belong to an organization. And then we are monitoring and grading the signals that come from that. So internally, we refer to these two processes as attribution and collection. And one of the things that really sets us apart and differentiates us is that both of these processes are run in parallel and they are continuous. We are never not running them, right? So with respect to attribution, the way it works is it starts with a company's top level domain. So if we were talking about Google, that would be google.com. So you feed us that domain. We go out and discover all of the sub related and affiliate domains associated with Google. And then we go out and find all the IP addresses that support each of those domains. And that forms what we refer to as the digital footprint, which represents all the publicly facing digital assets that belong to a company. You'll hear me say publicly facing a number of times during the presentation. Um, that's because everything that we're doing 
is based on publicly available information. We are never attempting anything that would deem to be uh, intrusive, like trying to authenticate to a, a machine. And none of this involves any agents, right? So technically speaking, we're scoring a lot of companies who don't necessarily know that we're scoring them, but that's okay because our process, again, is only based on publicly available information. So again, that was the attribution process. So put that off to the right here for a second. On my other hand, what we have, we have what we refer to as the collection process. So we have a globally distributed network of active and passive scanners. Um, we also own and operate a top five sinkhole. But with respect to the scanners, essentially what we're doing is we're scanning or crawling all of IPv4, right? We go up to every server, knock on the door of every port. We do a port scan, we grab the banner, we fingerprint what we found, and then we drop all these results into a data lake that contains essentially all the signals that we're harvesting off the publicly facing internet. And we're looking in other places, right? You know, we're looking at domains, SSL certificates. Again, the best way to think about it is anything that's publicly available on the internet, we grab it, right? So now we're at the point where we have all the assets that we know to belong to a given company, right? We have all the signals from the publicly face, public facing internet. So essentially what we do is we match signals to companies because pretty much every signal that we're collecting from the internet is attributed to either a domain or IP, right? And we now know all the domains and IPs that belong to a company, so we cross match. So we match the signals to the company, right? And then we grade our signals in accordance with leading cybersecurity frameworks, particularly NIST. And then from there, we render a score, right? That score is technically a weighted average of 10, what we call factor scores, which are grades on specific factors of security. And that score takes into account north of 95 unique issue types, right? So a few other quick points I want to call out here. So with respect to scale, we're currently scoring 5.1 million companies and we're on our way to being at 20 million by the end of the year. So we're currently sitting at about 10x, the next biggest competitor. And obviously once we get to 20, it's going to go up. So more likely than not, we've got a score on the company of interest, the one that you want to look at. But if for whatever reason we don't, we actually have the ability to score new companies in under five minutes, whereas most of the competition can take days to weeks. So long story short, you're never really gonna find yourself in a position where we can't provide a score on an entity of interest. One of the other big things I wanna call out here is we are the only true continuous monitoring solution in this space, and that's because of how we handle attribution. Now, if you remember, I just said that we take a continuous approach to attribution, meaning on a daily basis, we're first validating that any assets that we previously attributed do belong to the company, they still do, right? And then we go out there and discover any new assets that have popped up or appear during scan cycles. And then we're taking that continue, that updated set of assets, right? And that's what we're continuously monitoring, right? So we're continuously monitoring the signals that come from the assets and continuously ensuring that we're looking at the right ones, which is really important in today's world because think about all the dynamic infrastructure we use now. CDN, cloud, we're talking about ranges that are built to change on potentially a daily basis. So if you're not continuously validating that you're looking in the right place, you're not continuously monitoring, right? Most of the other folks in the space will essentially leverage more of a manual human approach to attribution, meaning they get a request to score a company, right? And they actually kick the request to an offshore team who goes out there and looks for the assets. Once they've identified them, they'll continuously monitor those assets until they're asked to refresh, right? So the way I see it, the way I think we see it is that that's not continuous monitoring. It's continuously monitoring a static set of domains and IPs that sure, at one point probably belong to the company, but with every passing day, the likelihood that you're looking in the right place goes down, right? Um, talked about 95 unique issue types. And to give you one more stat, just to give you a sense of the scale and the volume that we're talking about here, as of writing this, we're ingesting about 1.5 terabytes of data a day and discovering 15 billion security issues a week. So there's a ton of data here. And um, part of what you get access to is becoming, um, if you were to become a security scorecard customer. Uh, next slide, Jace. So what are our grades mean and how should we treat them and think about them? Look, at the end of the day, I'm of the mindset that anyone who's looking at a grade, whether it be their own or a third party, a customer, a vendor, whatever it may be, they're ultimately trying to understand the risk of breach, right? That's the universal, I guess, requirement or ask across most of these use cases. What is the likelihood that company A, B, or C gets breached, right? And we've actually done the work to help you understand that breach risk because we've been able to establish a statistically defensible correlation between our grades and breach risk. Um, we've been able to prove out and third parties have validated that in our system, if you've got an F, 
compared to if you had an A, you're 7.7 .7 times more likely to be breached. Now, how did we get here? We partnered with the industry leaders in the catastrophe modeling spaces. These are the folks that have these monster databases of breach disclosures. So essentially, we look up companies that they know are hit in our system at the time of the breach and the months leading up, and we look for a pattern, right? And that's kind of how we arrived at the uh, slide that we have here. Uh, next slide, Jason. So quick overview of the customer base. So we've got a bunch of them and we're really proud of the company we keep here. So like I mentioned earlier, it's roughly 1400 entities spanning 42 countries. We do have support for multiple languages. Um, with respect to company size, we really run the gamut, right? Our install base spans from SMBs to Fortune 100. And with respect to verticals, same can be said, right? This is very much so a vertical agnostic solution in the same way that credit ratings are vertical agnostic, right? So we've got representation across pretty much any ver vertical industry that you can think of with some particularly impressive representation within the pharmaceutical payment processing and insurance space. Um, and then, like I said earlier, one of the other things that's really unique here is that in most scenarios, um, we're supporting these customers across multiple use cases, which means we get to be multi-threaded with an organization um, and can be leveraged by multiple departments, personas, you know, so on and so forth. Um, all right, I think that's enough about scorecard for the time being. I'm going to pass the baton over to you, Jason, to provide some background on OnSpring. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Alex. That's that's great stuff, and it's I, I find it to be a fascinating story. You know, it's interesting. We have our own sort of co-founder story as well. Uh, uh, Chris and Chad are our co-founders, and and for those of you that know them, uh, they are um, very very curious, hardworking people. And, you know, back in, in 2010, they started OnSpring with this kind of idea or this hope to build something that was just better. Something, uh, a platform that was built on modern technology, uh, really focused on three core tenants, uh, performance. So this tool needs to perform. You can't sit and wait for your software to help you do your work. Uh, flexibility, it needs to be able to work the way that you want it to work and then usability. We want people, whether they're the highest level admin user or just a casual everyday user or, or once in a while user to have a good experience in the tool. And that's really where OnSpring was, was born, of, born out of. And, and so if you think about OnSpring as in terms of what we provide, our primary uh, you know, kind of value proposition is we provide, provide a best in class cloud-based no code process automation platform. Now, on top of this platform, what we've done is we built out a number of, of core solutions and, and use cases uh, to address, you know, known needs within the market. And, and our clients use OnSpring for a, a wide variety of different things. But, but really, if you think about why do they use OnSpring? Well, they want to be able to connect those key activities. They want to be able to uh, realize time and energy savings by, by getting all of their information in one single place, um, you know, one single set of processes and capabilities. Uh, and really, the goal is to surface actionable real-time data using our platform as the mechanism. And whether that's um, data that that originates or is um, created within OnSpring by end users or by our formula engine, or whether that's data that's coming in uh, via an integration such as with Security Scorecard, the goal, again, is to, to coordinate and consolidate all of that data, make it actionable, make it presentable to people. You know, I mentioned a number of that we have a number of use cases, and certainly uh, vendor third-party risk management is one of those primary use cases. So, uh, thinking about uh, everything from um, requesting and onboarding new vendors, putting a vendor through that due diligence process, performing risk assessments, um, performing uh, performance evaluations of vendors, managing contracts. So, lots of activities kind of encircling the whole life cycle of third-party management. And obviously that's a great place for security scorecard to fit in to provide another layer or another kind of texture of data uh, that we can already provide and already allow people to capture within the system. And you'll see that in action. Um, but the great thing about OnSpring is again, because it's fundamentally a platform, there's any number of use cases we can, we can let our clients uh, uh, you know, really take advantage of, of using the platform to, to solve uh, everything from, you know, kind of your traditional GRC activities like enterprise risk management, uh, policy and compliance management, audit management, and so forth, uh, into IT uh, service management, business operations, business continuity, you name it. 
Um, we have clients who have gone, uh, ha have been very creative with how they use the platform, but really the fundamental driver is always the same. It's, it's really being able to visualize, centralize, and prioritize that key information. Uh, there we go. And, and and how do they do that, or, or you know why are they doing that? Well, really, a, a big you know a, a big focus here is for them to find those blind spots. You know, when you have data that's sitting in uh, you know a, a decentralized set of repositories, whether that's Excel spreadsheets or you know maybe some is in a SharePoint site and some is in an Access database. People still use Access databases. Um, but but we deal with a lot of clients who are dealing with outdated solutions or dealing with disjointed uh, data sets. And, and the real benefit and the real value of bringing that into OnSpring is, again, to be able to make those critical relationships and really bubble things up to the surface uh, that require their attention. And, and as you guys can see here in the description, what is the, what is the driver there? Well, it's to, to make decision making smarter, make it faster and make sure that everybody is kind of accountable for what they've been assigned and, and what they're responsible for. Those are, those are the real key drivers of, of people using our platform as sort of this, this workflow automation and visual, visualization platform to manage these key activities. In, in really lying beneath the surface, I talked about it at the very beginning of this overview, but really it all comes back down to this platform, this very flexible no code platform. Um, Really, I'm, I'm a firm believer that anyone can be trained to be an on-spring administrator. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of people on this call who know how to sort of monkey around with, you know, Excel spreadsheets and do pivot tables and V lookups and all that fun stuff. Or maybe you just write some formulas in there or you're just interacting with the data. You're a great candidate for on-spring. Uh, you know, we really make it very accessible. Uh, we have a great platform that is very simple to use. You have the ability to fold in your workflows, your assessment logic, your automation controls, and really make the platform work for you the way that you want it to work. You know, there, it's, it's great to have a point solution that tells you how you should do something, but I'm a firm believer that uh, every organization, every department, every individual is unique. And the way that you guys interpret things and need to work with things is going to also inevitably be unique. That's where we're really well positioned to help you. And I already mentioned, again, with our core tenants of performance, flexibility, usability, we're really just trying to drive a great user experience and, and make it easy for you to do what can very much in very many cases be a, a difficult job. So Alex, I'd, I'd, you know, before we get into the actual demo of, of the uh, security scorecard data and how it sort of interacts with OnSpring, I'd love for you to kind of, you know, lay out this challenge that we came together to, to help solve, you know, you know, why are we coming together here? Sorry, I was stuck on mute. Yeah, no, I think uh, we definitely owe the problem some time, some unpacking here uh, to kind of paint a picture of kind of how big the problem is, how folks are kind of tackling it right now, absent an integrated solution such as ours, and, you know, how we can kind of partner as part of this integration, this partnership to deliver a solution for this problem, which is a big one for virtually every company at this point in time. So long story short, I like to make the comment that the build versus buy decision has been made. And what I mean here is when a company has a need, right? They don't go develop it internally. They typically go out and contract with the best in class provider or third party. So on the pro side, we get to take advantage of best in class technology and focus on our respective core competencies, which is great. The downside though, is we are now putting ourselves in a position where our continuity, our ability to operate is contingent on the performance of others, right? And it's not just the size of the vendor ecosystem that's creating the challenge here. And that size, because of the build by decision, it continues to expand, right? We're not talking about 10 or 50 vendors, we're talking about a hundred or thousands of vendors for your typical company right now. And it's not just the size though, it's the way in which we're leveraging the vendors that really elevates the risk created by third parties. Because look, in most scenarios, when a company is using a vendor to perform a service, they either need to share data with them or provision them with some form of networks access in order for them to perform the service, right? It is a necessary evil of using them. However, what it does is it creates a scenario where vendors become an extension of our attack perimeter, right? And unlike our true organic attack perimeter, we don't have the ability to monitor and control vendors the way we do ourselves. We don't have the same visibility over these third parties that we do our own organization. And that's really kind of the crux of the problem here. Uh, JC, you mind flipping forward one? 
Yeah, and then real quick, Alex, before uh, before we do flip forward, I, I, I at this point I am kind of interested to know. Obviously, there, these are some key challenges for third parties. But what I neglected to do is put up the poll that we wanted to to uh, ask everybody. So I'm I apologize for that, Megan. If you wouldn't mind sharing the poll. Now that we've talked a little bit about some of those third party challenges that we're trying to address together, we're really curious to know, you know, what is your biggest challenge uh, when it comes to third party risk management? And, and you can obviously it's multiple choice. So you can pick as many of these. And, and Alex, this should definitely feed into that that next slide, because I, I'm really excited to have you kind of walk walk us through that next slide. So take a couple of seconds here. Um, provide us your answers. And uh, Megan, whenever you feel it appropriate, feel free to put up those responses so, so Alex and I can kind of digest those. Yeah, and I think, Jason, the fact that we have so many answers to this question <laughs> highlights not just how multi-threaded and complex this is. You know, I keep throwing the term third-party risk management or supplier risk management on, on, on the problem. And there are so many micro challenges within the use case and this version of the use case is really only focused on vendors and suppliers, right? You know, if we really think about third-party risk management, the end goal is to ultimately assess the potential impact and or ramifications on a company's bottom line, right? The thought process here is that if your vendors or suppliers don't show up to perform a service, you can't deliver a service to your customers, so you're going to forego revenue, right? But if you take a step back and think about it, if a key customer of yours goes dark, someone that represents a meaningful concentration of revenue, you're going to have the same hit on your bottom line that you would have if a supplier went dark. Here it's different mm -hmm. that you had the service ready for consumption, just that the other person wasn't able to consume it. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that we have this many problems under the umbrella when we talk about suppliers. If you take a step back and think about true third-party risk management that encapsulates customers, the balloon gets bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know, Alex, if you're, I, I'm not really surprised by those results. I'm certainly not surprised that all of these got votes, but, um, you know, the the due diligence and security information, collecting that information, I imagine it, in many places can be very kind of labor intensive. And and I think what, what we'll show everyone here is that we're really going to look to enhance that capability. Maybe it's not a, you know, it's not a one size fits all catch all solution, but it certainly addresses a very big area of exposure and risk. Yeah, no, this, um, I think, and look how equally weighted all the responses. Do. Right. Very clear that everyone is struggling with a lot of the problems under this umbrella, which is great, not because you all are struggling, but because we have <laughs> here that can help to solve the problem. Absolutely. So yeah, Alex, let's, let's check out that next slide, because I think this will give everyone sort of like this visual perspective on what we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, I think this kind of illustrates the data sharing and network connections that I was speaking to on the previous slide, right? Like if you look at you in the middle, it's very easy to see how quickly a problem at any of these layers can quickly sim swim back up its upstream and impact you, right? Like we've only been talking about third parties here. Um, what about fourth parties, right? Like you may put a potential SaaS vendor through, you know, all of its paces, and it came out clean, you did a really thorough security investigation, they passed with flying colors, but what if they cheaped out when it came to the hosting provider and went with kind of a B or a C player, right? You could very easily find yourself in a scenario where that SaaS provider is unavailable to you and not because of anything that they did in their environment, but because they're relying on someone else who has a problem. So um, not to uh, spread fear through the room, but it is important to be cognizant of just how connected the world we're living in is. and. Uh, how diligent and vigilant you need to be as it relates to the security of the players that you're relying on both directly and indirectly. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I, I think we've, we've laid out kind of, you know, who we are and, and kind of the, the problem that we're being faced with. I think this is the exciting part of, of the demo I, probably for both of us, Alex, is just to start talking about what does that mean, right? What does that mean in, in terms of say, taking, you know, the great, you know, that's, just mountains of data that you guys are able to analyze and, and, you know, update and refresh on a constant basis and all of these very critical areas. And then how can we consume or, or pull that information on spring and really make some use out of it in the context of our sort of day-to-day -day workflows and activities. So with that, I would love to just dig in a little deeper and let's just talk about it a little bit. So, um, for those of you who are joining us from Security Scorecard and, and have um, you know logged into their platform, I've been on their platform. It is impressive. It is a really 
Uh, it is a really neat experience. There's just, again, just a wealth of information out there. You can go as deep as you want to in terms of the historical perspective and the, the layers of information. But the beautiful thing that that we've done with Security Scorecard and this integration is we've made a lot of that great uh, data available very simply and very easily to consume into a tool like OnSpring that can now be used to, to kind of uh, layer this information into your your day to day, into your ongoing decision making and evaluation processes, and we're actually going to give you a couple of examples of how we pull that data in and how we put it to work for you. Okay, so for those of you who are OnSpring customers, this looks very familiar. For those of you who are not, you were looking at an OnSpring dashboard, and a dashboard, if you think about it, is really your window into the system, uh, just like with a lot of, of different tools that that offer reporting and in those sorts of capabilities. And, and OnSpring really takes pride in the ability to very quickly and easily bubble that data up to the surface. So um, just as I kind of scan through here, um, you can see that we're basically taking the data that Security Scorecard provides, whether that's information about the individual uh, risk factors themselves or uh, how a risk factor compares or, or sits in, in the context of its overall uh, vendor score, um, how are how are the scores breaking down by industry? What issues are we looking you know to to monitor? All of this information makes its way into OnSpring using using a very very simple piece of configuration on the OnSpring side. If you can get your API key from Security Scorecard, you can leverage the OnSpring Data Connector to very simply and easily configure our Data Connector. And once you configure it, I always like to use the Ronco term, right? Set it and forget it you can set it up on a schedule. So to Alex's point, these guys are, are constantly refreshing and updating data. So if you find that for a certain data set um, of, of maybe your most critical vendors, you might want to set the frequency to evaluate or kind of sniff what those vendors are doing or what's impacting them uh, to happen on a daily basis. Maybe you've got another portfolio set that, hey, analyzing that or, or getting new information once a week or once a month is just fine. That's really up to you. You're in control of that. But getting this data into OnSpring from Security Scorecard, all that heavy lifting's already been done, which is great. So what data comes in and how can we use it? I think that's the really important piece here. So I'm going to start with this report here, Security Scorecard Profile Grade Distribution. So back to Alex's point, that grade is a great indicator of, hey, where are there pockets of risk or where should I be the most concerned? Well, if I have clients that are operating at a D or an F, that might give me the greatest cause for concern. So let's just go take a look and see who we've got on the, the D list, right? Uh, so we've got this security scorecard profile here for Canon Tech. It's a made up company, they don't exist, but we're gonna go ahead and show you how this data works in OnSpring. And again, give you some ideas for how you can make use of that information. So I filter on that, I can see my D rating there and I'm gonna just dive right into that profile record and start kind of analyzing what's in here. Start looking at, you know, hey, what, what is security scorecard feeding us? And again, how can we make use of that? So you can see here, now we're in a content record in OnSpring. This is really where all of the, all of the data in OnSpring lives. This becomes now a, a, a jumping off point for any sort of reporting, any sort of automation, any sort of reviews, approvals, that sort of thing. So if you see here, we've got um, you know, our overall company profile. We've got some information about the vendor. Um, we actually have this related to a vendor record in OnSpring. And I'll jump into that a little bit later to show you exactly how we can mine these security scorecard results and place them into that broader context of your overall vendor management program. But in some cases, we've, we've kind of ingested data from security scorecards. So it could be that score or that letter grade. They also give you the average grade and score of, of uh, companies in that same industry. So you can really compare and contrast and say, hey, if I'm working with this uh, particular tech provider in the healthcare industry, how do they compare to their peers? Is, that, is this something I should be concerned about? Well, that's where OnSpring comes into play because what we have the ability to do is sort of monitor and produce information about what direction is the needle moving in? What's the percentage score change we've realized? Um, how does that uh, organization relate in terms, uh, you know, or in relation to other organizations in their same industry? So again, that comparing and contrasting. So pulling in some basic data to start with from Security Scorecard already gives us a little bit of an indicator to say, okay, well, we're below the industry average by, by um, you know, greater than 10%. That in and of itself might set off some of those alarm bells. 
But now we can go a little bit deeper. I'm going to click on this factors and issues. So one of the things I really like about uh, uh, the security scorecard data set, it's not just this one big overarching letter grade. They've actually broken down all of these different kind of cybersecurity areas of concern or areas of monitoring, if you will, into individual factors. So you could see qubit score, hacker chatter, and so forth. Well, here's a really cool thing about this. And Alex and I were just talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, he gave me a really kind of cool use case. And Alex, I'm probably going to butcher it and, and, and not do it the justice that I need to, but I'm, I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The, the great thing about these factors is each one obviously means something different. And I know Alex and his team can go very deep on what, you know, your DNS health means, for example. But just for example, um, you know, when you think about third party risk management and vendor risk management, one of the biggest drivers of, of where and how you're going to focus your attention on a particular third party is certainly going to be on the nature of the services they provide. So Alex gave a great example, like, you know, let's say, for example, you have a third party that does all of your payroll processing. And, you know, everybody can agree, I think that payroll processing is very important. We'd all be mad if it wasn't working as intended. Um, Alex brought up this point that said, well, hey, if you've got a payroll processor and you can make the assumption that they're going to regularly be emailing with your, uh, with your customers, you know, there's a chance then that that concept, that fact that they could be emailing regularly with your customers opens up a whole specific set of concerns because there's a higher likelihood that if they have a breakdown and, and I, I apologize, Alex, I think it was like the SPF configuration. Yeah. If you go ahead, Alex, yeah, maybe take this, take this the rest of the way, because I really liked where you were going with that. No, no worries here. Yeah. Happy to do it. So yeah, I mean, think about this scenario, right? You got a payment, uh, payroll, provider, right? So two things are kind of assumed here on behalf of your employees. One, you're going to get emails from this provider, right? We all get emails from our provider. And two, it would be pretty par for the course if this provider was asking them about potentially sensitive information like bank accounts and social security and so on and so forth. So this DNS factor that we currently have pulled up, one of the primary focuses of the DNS factor in our platform is email security. One of the bigger issues that we look for within the factor is uh, missing SPF record configurations, right? Or lack of an SPF record configuration. So if I see that my payroll provider doesn't have SPF protection on its primary email sending domains and my employees are expecting to hear from them and they're not gonna be spooked if they ask about sensitive details like credit card or social, it's kind of like a mini disaster waiting to happen, right? Because you've literally just set yourself up for the ultimate phishing attack that really has every ingredient required to make it successful. Bad for you, but successful for the attacker, right? So basically, I think kind of the message here is we can take the vendors that you're leveraging and based on the nature of the service they deliver, their relationship or interaction points with employees within your organization, we can essentially pinpoint issues that we feel set up or create a scenario where a really effective attack could be carried out. And essentially, once we've mapped vendor type to issue type, if you will, that could potentially be problematic, we can kind of use that system for, to kind of modern for, mod, monitor for what could be a really uh, disastrous event and, and hopefully prevent against it. Yeah, thanks for that, Alex. That's a, again, I knew he would be more eloquent at describing that because he deals with that every day. But it's a it's a fair point. And and again, how do we make how do we make use of that in a tool like OnSpring? Well, what we've done here is we've got this DNS health as a factor that we're feeding in information from Security Scorecard. Well, we've added in a simple field that basically allows you, based again, based on that third party, based on the nature of that third party services or what they provide to place a particular factor on a watch list. Very simple flag that we set, but it can also be very powerful. So I have a couple of data points in here based on the fact that this particular client scored an F on their DNS health. Um, number one, I can see that it, you know, their score for DNS health uh, falls well below what their actual company score is, you know, it, to be exact, almost 15% lower. And, you know, we're 10% we're or more than 10% below where they, where they are as an overall organization. So, yeah, they scored a D or even if, let's say, they got a B or a C. But if this particular factor uh, was causing a problem, it doesn't matter if they're scoring a B overall. This is the potential uh, hole in the whole thing. This is the potential issue that, you know, to Alex's point, could really be catastrophic. So by doing something simple, 
by watch listing a particular, uh, you know, a particular factor, we can do a number of different things. We could say, hey, if that factor falls below a grade of C, we're going to alert the vendor manager or the vendor risk management team, or we're going to highlight every single one of these that's 10% or more below where its overall company score uh, falls. Or, you know, what Alex had mentioned is that they're also highlighting these individual issues that relate to that company specific factor. So by virtue of the fact that this, uh, this item is watch listed, we can also watch list any um, any related issues and require those issues to go through some level of workflow or approval. Alex had a great idea this morning. He's learned enough about OnSpring to know what it's capable of. He said, well, hey, Jason, if, if for some reason, you know, the, the score came in through the integration and it tripped some wire, would there be a way to kind of blast a notification out to all employees? Absolutely. That is a, I thought that was a really great use case. So now we might say, hey, the DNS health score for our payroll processor has, has really fallen below a threshold. We maybe aren't going to share this specific information with everyone in the organization, but we may want to spin up a notice that says, hey, here's a potential scam alert. You might, you know, we are at an increased risk of getting spam emails from this provider. So please treat that, uh, you know, very carefully as you, as you normally would, of course, but treat it even more carefully than you would. Uh, a, a, so, phishing, a phishing risk alert, if you will. Look, that's just one example, right? Because that's yeah. a notification <laughs> workflow. But I think the real exciting stuff from an automation standpoint focuses more on like healing and or preventative actions, right? And we're going to get a little bit more into that when we talk about some of the workflows that we can enable here. Jace, I just did want to call out one more thing. Please. In regards to kind of the industry average. Um, yeah. Overall score. I'm a big fan of benchmarking. I think benchmarking is the, the shortcut to intelligent decision-making. And I think benchmarks specifically in the cyberspace are quite actionable. They're not just a number on a screen that's pretty and satisfies a few personas within an organization. And the reason why I think it's in, um, potentially actionable and also very important is because you know, I like to say that you don't have to be faster than the so you, you don't have to be faster than the bear, right? You just got to be faster than the slowest guy in your group. And that's because the modern day, you know, attack world, right? The way things typically play out is a group typically sets their sights on a specific asset class or asset type. And that asset class or asset type more likely than not is going to be common or it's going to be um, owned, if you will, by a group of similar companies, right? Folks in your peer group. So when they go and decide who they wanna focus their attentions on, they're gonna go after the lowest hanging fruit, right? They're gonna go after the company that appears to be the weakest. And that literally is the vantage point that Scorecard is providing, right? It's that outside in hacker eye view, we're essentially showing you what bad guys would see during the reconnaissance phase of an attack. So where I'm going here is that it's important to be above the industry average, not because it's a gold star that you can wear on your shirt and you know parade around about being better than you know company A or company B. I quite literally think in a lot of scenarios, being strong within the peer group will in a lot of respects deter the attacker from focusing on you versus one of your, your weaker peers. That's a great point, Alex. I, I didn't even think about it in that regard, but I, I'm glad you brought that up because you know there's there's value in having this information and benchmarking and you know, there's also value in that that's sort of intrinsic in terms of, hey, when I go to negotiate the contract again, okay. do I have additional information at my disposal that could potentially be used as leverage if I've, I'm working with someone who has a weak security posture? Um, all kinds of great information that these guys provide that we have the ability to ingest through this integration as well. So uh, one thing I really love that these guys do is they kind of do constant evaluations against, you know, various common compliance framework. I know, Alex, you had mentioned the, you know, kind of the, the NIST CSF and, you, you know, we've got the, the CMMC. There's all sorts of different, um, you know, kind of evaluations that they're performing. You can see whether or not they've uh, passed or failed in relation to a particular uh, framework or a particular section. So now you can even look across all of your vendors and say, hey, is there a particular area or a particular pocket where we might be more exposed? You know, looking at the results history, Alex, I know you and I had talked about this sort of count. How many times do we find, you know, a, a weak cipher? Well, you know, we can keep a running total or a running count of those. And then in OnSpring, uh, what we do, uh, what we also have the ability to do from an automation standpoint is kind of stamp everything in time and say, hey, over time, 
how has the grade been trending up or down? Have they, did they start at a D and, and move up towards a B or was it the other way around? You're going to have that capability. You're going to have that data at your disposal, um, you know, within the on-screen platform. And the last thing I'll say from a content perspective is, you know, back here on my security scorecard company profile, this is a profile that specifically ingests information from security scorecard. But in this case, we've related it to a vendor record. So the reason that's important is kind of gets back to how some of our clients use OnSpring to manage their third-party programs. And I'll just go ahead and, and put that back into view mode just to give it a cleaner view. But you can see some of the other activities that organizations are performing, managing contracts, uh, onboarding activities, offboarding activities. Well, third-party integration monitoring becomes a key component of that. So when I'm, when I'm relating my vendor record directly to a security scorecard company profile. And now I'm mining that information into my vendor record, uh, you know, it, through those formulas and through that relationship. Now my security scorecard grade, my above or below average rating or whatever indicators I find most valuable within the security scorecard data set can now be used to effectively drive the overall risk rating or the overall criticality of my vendor in addition to other evaluations I might be performing, I might have my own proprietary risk evaluation or might be using a SIG assessment. But really, if you think about it, this their data both kind of supplements and complements that information and becomes another layer to your overall uh, you know, vendor risk management program. And then again, when we go back out to the dashboard, another thing I love about dashboards is they can be really used to bubble up information and, and show you when something requires action. So if I have uh, issues that are related to those factors that I've put on that watch list. Well, now those have been reported to me right here on the dashboard. And if I really wanted to, I could start reviewing the information, look at the descriptions. I can indicate that I've gone ahead and reviewed those or I've taken action and I can effectively knock items off my list. So that's where we talk about entering items into workflow or prompting action. And again, I feel like we're really just scratching the surface here, Alex. I know there's a lot of different ways at least in OnSpring, that we can trigger alerts or events or create other records or, or place items into workflow just based on the information that we're, we're ingesting from Security Scorecard, which I think is a, you know, kind of puts us at a real advantage here because, uh, and I don't know why I stopped sharing because I want to go back to my presentation real quick so we can finish stuff off. Um, I think it really puts us at an advantage though, because there's any number of ways we can go and plus, I would venture to guess that there's a lot of creative people on the call who can probably tell us a thing or two about, hey, here's how I'd make uh, use of that information. And we're all ears in that regard. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, integrations are great, but I often see folks tend to kind of just pull as much information from one system into another. And if the point of the integration is just to render information in a different fashion, I'm actually going to argue that the company that built it probably did a better job. So we're kind of wasting our time, right? I think the integrations make sense when the information pulled from one system into the other can enable something synergistic, right? One plus one equals three. And that's exactly what we have here. But before we kind of go into the specific workflows that we can enable with the integration, I do want to spend a little time talking about, you know, how we're currently approaching this vendorous management challenge, absent an integration like this, absent these two tools coming together to deliver what we've built here. So look, VRM is not an unknown challenge, right? Most organizations are painfully aware of it, and they should be because the statistics point to somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of the breaches that we read about today are triggered by a third party, right? I mean, everyone heard about solar winds. Um, there's another one on its scale called the Cellian. You know, look at the Hafnium bugs um, surface in the Microsoft Exchange server. Like, there's literally going to be a new one every day. So it's not a new problem, and there are a lot of activities, approaches, um, processes that have been de developed and deployed to help kind of manage and mitigate the risks. So if you look across a company who has invested in VRM, you'll typically see some combination of penetration test, security questionnaire, maybe there's an on-site on audit requirement or assessment, right? Um, Third-party attestation is big. So maybe, you know, organization asks you to show a SOC report or an ISO cert. And maybe they go as far as to say, hey, let's see some outputs from internal security tools, right? Show me the phone management output, right? So these activities are all extremely important. They aren't going anywhere and they shouldn't because look, at the end of the day, there is no silver bullet in this game. And I repeat, there is no silver bullet in this game. Um, 
So it's all about using these activities in conjunction with a rating and an integration with a GRC platform such as <clears throat> OnSpring. Um, and the other thing I would point out is if you think about these activities, if you run down the list, there are three common challenges across all of them that something like a rating directly addresses, right? So challenge number one is all these methods involve taking a completely static measurement of cybersecurity, which is kind of problematic because it's the most dynamic risk factor the modern business has ever encountered, right? Look, the responses that you provided in that questionnaire, sure, they might be valid on the day they were filled in, and some might, but fast forward a couple of days, a week, a month, I guarantee that a lot of these responses are no longer valid, right? What could have been completely secure and resilient yesterday can be, you know, porous and weak tomorrow, right? That is the nature of the zero day exploit, right? Um, what's great about the rating is it keeps pace with cybersecurity and the rate of change, right? Because it's a continuous monitoring solution, at least ours is, right? Um, issue number two is these methods leave a lot of room for bias and your human error, right? I mean, take, you know, the penetration test as an example. I'm not arguing that the pen testers are looking the other way and being influenced to give the organization a favorable output, but do remember that the organization that is being assessed, they ordered it on themselves, right? They knew it was coming. They had an opportunity to prepare. You know, I want to see what they look like when they haven't had that opportunity, and if we go back to the questionnaire, I don't think it's a secret that most people are filling these things out is in an effort to win a contract, right? And I can pretty much guarantee that most organizations will arrive at a question or a set of questions where they know the honest or complete answer will result in a disqualification. And even if they're not being uh, willfully misleading, maybe they decided to delegate the questionnaire to an intern who has no security background because they're getting hit with a thousand of these, right? And this intern is copying and pasting from a document and they have no idea what they're actually putting in there. The long and short of it is the quality of the output really can't be trusted in a lot of scenarios. So what's great about the rating and, and scorecard is that we are using objective scanners, right? They don't have a friend at a company that they want to make when a contract, um, they don't make human-based mistakes. Um, so it's a direct, um, directly address that challenge in the bias and the uh, potential for human error. And then the last thing I'd call out is um, these methods are really expensive. They're time consuming, they're labor intensive, which look, I guess isn't a deal breaker in and of itself. But if you couple that with what we talked about earlier, which is the ever expanding modern day vendor ecosystem, the idea of poor performing all these activities at scale is it's not viable, right? You're either going to go broke, you know, doing these activities at scale across all of your vendors, or you're going to protect the budget and have a glaring blind spot that could technically blow up on you at any point in time, right? I mean, the, the average pen test is what, $10,000 a day more? I mean, I've worked with companies that have dedicated teams, dedicated teams for the questionnaire process. So look, the rating is not free, um, but it is a fraction of the cost of a lot of these activities. And what's also great is it doesn't have an on-site requirement and it's available immediately, right? So I think the message here is, Again, we're not arguing to do away with any of these activities, quite the opposite. We're actually arguing that we should be integrating the rating in the processes that involve these activities and doing it through using a tool like OnSpring that can enable automation and just-in-time responses, right? And I guess that kind of brings us to our next slide here, which is, so what are these workflows that I'm referring to? Um, and how can we realize these synergies with the integration uh, that I'm speaking to here? So workflow number one is what I refer to as the traffic cop. And it's my favorite workflow because the efficiencies and just-in-time benefits that it produces, right? So if you think about how you can insert scorecard into a process, you can either treat it as an additional means of measurement, meaning I go up to a vendor, I run the pen test, I send them a questionnaire, I audit them. And in addition to that, I establish a minimum grade they have to maintain based on their criticality tier, and I pass fail them based on where they come in against that grade threshold. There's nothing wrong with that, right? That's completely fine. I see a lot of folks doing that, but for me to really get the bang for the buck, you gotta deploy the traffic cop, right? So with the traffic cop, we're essentially taking the rating or in taking components of it, whether it be the overall grade, a factor grade, the presence of a specific issue, right? And we're essentially mapping those components to one of the other activities like the questionnaire, like the pen test. And then we establish what we refer to as a go, no go, partial go threshold meaning we're only gonna fire the activity um, if the threshold is tripped. And in addition to kind of triggering a just-in-time assessment and avoiding an unnecessary one, right? 
We could also use the thing that tripped the wire to help right size or inform what we should be thinking about and or assessing, right? So let's say hypothetically, we come up with a workflow where we say that we are only going to run a penetration test if the vendor falls below a score of B, right? So off the bat, we have got a big win here because instead of running a pen test every time, which is expensive, we're only gonna do it in scenarios where we deemed it to be warranted. Now we go a step further and say, okay, not only do we only run it if they're below a B, but we're actually only gonna focus on the vectors that map to the factor scores that are below a C, right? So instead of running the gamut, testing everything that we can get our hands on, we're focusing specifically on the things that trip the wire in the first place, right? So if you take that concept, what you have here is a just-in-time assessment that lets you avoid unnecessary assessments, and it's also right-sized in that we can focus specifically on the things that warranted the assessment in the first place. All right, so that's the traffic cop, and we're actually gonna get into a specific workflow that we can enable with the integration in a second. I do wanna spend a little bit more time talking about some of the other um, workflows we can enable here. So the next one is streamlining assessments for low tier vendors by relying, relying on grades and grades only. Um, I'm of the mindset that uh, if the consequences that a vendor can create for you are minimal, you shouldn't be wasting excessive energy and effort on assessing them, right? It's the risk reward profile. profile. Um, this concept can also be applied to RFPs, right? And that you've got a number of parties in front of you, you're only going to pick one, right? So we want to be able to quickly eliminate parties um, who are never going to make the cut because they miss a table stakes requirement, like they have poor security, right? But going back to the streamlining assessments for lower tier vendors, given the fact that the risk that they can create for you is low, you shouldn't be spending a time, a lot of energy, time, and effort and cost on assessing them. So what's so great about this platform mm -hmm. is we can streamline the assessment by just using a grade, right? Establish a threshold that they need to maintain or they need to meet. And if they're not there, you fail them. If they're above it, you pass them. Um, and it's not that black and white, right? Because when you fail them, and we'll get this into this in a second, we do have a way in which you can collaborate and engage with them in an effort to get them above that threshold. But for the time being, the idea here with streamlining lower tier vendor assessments is to rely on the grade and the grade only. Next one, next workflow that I think is pretty powerful here that I see as a problem for many organizations is prioritizing the assessment backlog, right? All the time, I'm told I have a massive backlog of assessments. I don't have the time to run an inherent risk assessment on all my vendors, and I don't know where to start, right? Because look, if you had the luxury of doing inherent risk, the answer would be right in front of you, right? Start with the high tier vendors and work your way down the pole, right? Because at the end of the day, when you're prioritizing the backlog, your number one goal is to have eyes first on the high risk vendor or high criticality vendor that has poor security, right? Because that is the uh oh moment we're trying to avoid here, right? They have poor security and they touch a lot of important stuff. So think about this. We can't really take a proxy for inherent risk just by looking at a company from the outside looking in because look, inherent risk is a function of your relationship and use case of the company. And we can't figure, what the, figure out what that looks like just by scanning an environment. However, we have a direct proxy for security and that we have our ratings, right? So if you were to take that backlog and you sorted by low grade to high grade and went down the list in that order, what you're guaranteeing is that you're going to have eyes early on that high risk, low security vendor because you sorted by security. The worst thing that happens here is what you spend cycles uh, first assessing or assessing earlier on in the process, someone who's low criticality tier with poor security, which look, it's not the most efficient use of your time, but it's not going to hurt you, right? So these grades are a great way to prioritize the assessment backlog. Last thing I want to talk about here is uh, inviting vendors to engage and collaborate, right? So like I said earlier, with that low, um, low risk streamlining, low risk uh, assessments for low tier vendors, we don't necessarily want to fail them and walk away from them because at the end of the day, this VRM game, the vendor risk management use case, it's way more efficient when we approach it with this carrot versus a stick, right? If we go out and beat up vendors because they don't have a security or they're not meeting requirements, we're never going to get anywhere, right? And this problem is way too big for us to tackle on our own or for our vendors to tackle on their own. So one of the big benefits of this platform and what we can do here is by virtue of your contract, we give you the right to invite any of the vendors that you're monitoring with the solution. And once you invite them, they actually get visibility at no charge into a light version of the platform that just shows them their score. 
So what this creates is a scenario where both parties are looking at the same information and they have an opportunity to collaborate and work together to improve the risk versus beating each other up based on the risks and um, potentially fraying a relationship that made sense. Um, I know we're running out of time here. This is the questionnaire workflow that I was alluding to here. Um, this is something that's totally actionable with this integration here. So like we talked about earlier, the idea here is to avoid the unnecessary recurring assessment instead of sending the same questionnaire to the same vendor on the same date every year where the likelihood that it went out on the right date is actually one in 365, we trigger or deploy a workflow where you're only gonna send the questionnaire if they fall below a minimum threshold, like a C grade. And we can actually go a step further in that when they trip that threshold, when we send that questionnaire, instead of sending them, I don't know, let's assume, you know, average security questionnaire has a couple hundred questions in it, we can actually send questions that are specific to the new issues that came on their card to bring them down below the threshold. So Jason, if it was like vulnerabilities, let's say we've got a questionnaire loaded into OnSpring that's focused on patching cadence and vulnerability management. Maybe that's what we send out when they trip below the threshold instead of sending them questions that might not be relevant given what tripped the wire. Wow. Yeah, and that can that can all be automated just based on simple rules that you said. I mean, I think everything you you say makes makes perfect sense there because you know you're really just taking data and and ingesting the data that you guys provide, and then based on the rules you set, you tell OnSpring where it needs to send you in terms of what do I need to review, what do I need to send to the vendor, what do I need to get from the vendor. You can really make it, um, you know, very slick in that regard. Absolutely. All right. I know we kind of uh, took you up to the end. There were a couple of questions and we'll make sure we get those, um, you know, answered and, and, and kind of back to everyone who participated. Um, there's our contact information. Uh, Alex is dressed much better than I am in that picture and that's fine. I can deal with that. I am not a fashionista. So uh, at any rate, please feel free to email myself or Alex. We've been collaborating quite a bit. Um, I really, I personally want to thank uh, you know, our marketing team and the security scorecard team, they're just, you know, uh, all of them, you know, really are the ones that made this possible. I just kind of got to be along for the ride. So um, really appreciate this, really looking forward to, to collaborating with some of you on this. Yeah, no, it's uh, honestly, couldn't be more excited about the potential in front of us. And we've got some early success stories as well. And we're actually going to be running a program where any of the on spring customers and potentially prospects are actually entitled to an exclusive offer where we'll essentially enable a 60 day free trial for a 100 company monitoring solution of scorecard that you guys can consume directly through your integrated on-spring environment. So I get that we talked through a lot of ideas here during this presentation, but there's actually an opportunity for all of you to put some of these into practice into play because of this partnership without necessarily needing to uh, go get approval for, for an invoice of any time. So type. Yep. So would, uh, would love the opportunity to work with all of you. And again, Jason, huge thank you to you and the team. Um, future is bright for the partnership. We look forward to working with all of you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan, for, for running the show here. Bye now. Are, are we doing Q&A? No. I think uh, we can if, if, if some people want to hang on for Q&A, Megan, if you, if you have you know, one or two burning questions that you want us to get through, we certainly can. I'm She's actually, yeah, I'm looking through the uh, Q&A poll right now. Okay. Do you see TPRM for cybersecurity and compliance as two sides of a coin or expressly a separate concern? Should they be managed in tandem? Where do you see the market going? Um, I love this question, right? Because a lot of the TPRM and VRM requirements are actually mapped directly to controls that an organization has exposure to, right? From a regulation. So um, Hussein, I, I definitely see them being two sides of the same coin. At least speaking for scorecard, I'd say that 90% of my VRM customers have exposure to at least one regulation with teeth. And a lot of the requirements that live within their VRM program are in part dictated by the uh, regulation that I have exposure to. And Jason, that's an area we didn't really get into a conversation about, but we actually have a compliance offering that we can enable between our organizations. Yep. At a high level, what we've done is we've evaluated all these major regulations, isolated controls that we can give visibility to from the outside looking in, and we map control issues to a control if the issue is symptomatic of control failure, right? So if you had a control which was you must have a patching program in place. We would actually map 
vulnerability issue types to it in that if you have vulnerabilities, we either know that you don't have a program or if you have a program, maybe there's some challenges with it. So compliance is a use case. It's the same side, different sides of the same coin. It's something that OnSpring and uh, Scorecard through the integration can enable. Absolutely. Yep. And, and I know there's a couple of other questions, Alex. We'll take those offline and make sure that the folks yeah. who put in those questions get their responses. Thank you, everyone, for, for uh, joining us. And Alex, thanks again, man. Thank you, Jason. We'll speak to you soon. Take care. Take care, everyone.